today we find ourselves in Daniel, the fifth chapter. A little background information. First, if you'll recall, when we started our study in Daniel, I said in the first six chapters, there are at least six primary lessons. In the first chapter, the lesson was that It's possible for God's people living in a foreign land to face tremendous pressure to compromise against God and to come out of that victorious. And in reality, the scripture teaches us that the place where we now dwell is not our home. That we are living in an earthly setting that is a mere shadow of what it was originally created and designed to be. Even those things that we consider to be so beautiful in nature are compromised and damaged. Paul tells us that I have not seen and ear hath not heard what God has prepared for those who love him. In chapter 2, we learn that man's rebellious government against God will not last forever and that it'll be brought to an end and God will establish his everlasting kingdom. Human beings are prone to something that's called a normalcy bias. That's the idea that things will always continue as they have been. And the reality is that's completely contrary to the word of God. The word of God tells us that everything that we hold to is going to change. It tells us that there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. It tells us that the relationships between human beings and a damaged creation are going to be different. It means that we are going to be a race of people that will never again see rebellion, that will never again have an unction to be involved in rebellion, that will forever be in immediate communion with God, and will always have the very best of intentions to every human being we have contact with. Now that's different. In chapter three, we learn that God will never allow trials in this world system Uh, to bring negative consequences to damage a believer. You can't steal from somebody who doesn't own anything. You can't kill a dead man. And when our hearts and lives are set in an uncompromising fashion toward God, when the decision has been made that he is our king and anything he says is correct, When that occurs, sadness can only endure for a night because the end is absolutely certain. In the fourth chapter, that God is able to save the most powerfully powerful and wicked people. Never, ever, ever write anybody off thinking that they cannot get saved. God is absolutely sovereign. He knows whom he is predestined. And regardless of what we think of people that, for which it's easy to see them as unredeemable, God can redeem anyone. And he will respond to the prayers of his saints concerning the salvation and the rescue of others. Uh, I made the comment, you know, this being Mother's Day, about how influential and how God has used mothers throughout biblical history as a starting place, a foundation to accomplish the most amazing things. Uh, I, I never had the opportunity to know my mother in a substantial way. But I did have the opportunity to know a godly mother and to see what that was. And that was in my mother-in-law. 
I can tell you, you have to be careful how you judge people by outward appearances. My mother-in-law was short and a little bit round and soft-spoken. And man, could she cook. But I'll tell you something else she was. When she decided to open up her me mail, everything in hell shook. I am confident the demons trembled to think she was going to cover us in prayer for another day. And she had a great impact in my life. I know that on a daily basis, she prayed for every grandchild. She prayed for each of her children and their spouses. And she never made a big deal about it because it didn't really have anything to do with what we thought or didn't think about what she did. That was her life. She knew that the power of prayer was substantial and that it shook unseen realms. And she knew also that God responded when she spoke. And the fact that my wife and I have been married 43 years, I am confident that it is in no small part because of a little round woman who knew how to cook, also knew how to pray. I believe that for children, for the many things that children face in this life, for the many things that grandchildren face in this life. A praying mother and a praying grandmother can stop the, the most well-laid plans of the enemy. God has given women great power. Chapter 5. In chapter 5, 23 years have passed between chapter 4 and chapter 5. Daniel, who was so venerated by the king, Nebuchadnezzar, has slipped back into almost obscurity after Nebuchadnezzar died. Nebuchadnezzar, apparently not having a male heir, is succeeded by the, the son of one of his wives, one of his uh, uh, wives at a distance. And because that man had no interest in administration, had no interest in crunching the numbers and doing the daily, day to day, dealing with the governmental issues. He named a co-regent, which was his son, who was ultimately the grandson of Nebuchadnezzar. We find evidence in these first few verses that the failure that existed in Israel and eventually caused its downfall is the failure that causes the downfall of the Babylonian Empire. And this is important, parents. As we look through the history of Israel, there is one recurring, overriding theme. And oddly enough, it's not worshiping false gods, though they did, it's not not obeying the commandments of Moses, which they didn't. The one theme that permeates everything that happened to Israel is that devout parents who saw the miracle hand of God move in their nation never managed to communicate the faith to their children. And generations were lost because God was not honored in the home. Not at the temple. Temple worship continued. It was the lack of a reverence and honor for God 
at home. That's what destroyed Israel. All the other things were a manifestation of the fact that the people had lost contact with their God and thereby no longer regarded his law, no longer regarded him as the only God. Now we find in Babylon a king that's witnessed three substantial miracle events. That king, even after having been through the remarkable circumstances where he eats like an animal, he's lost his mind for seven seasons. Everybody watches and sees what the God of heaven has done to this man. And then as God restores him, having preserved his kingdom, they see a change in him where his relationship is with God is no longer through the vehicle of other people. Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, and Daniel. But speaks of God on a very personal basis. Speaks to, of him as though he has personal direct knowledge. Has relationship. The man saved. However, in just two generations, the fear, the reverence, the very knowledge of the name of the God who created the universe is lost to the royal line. And the destruction of Babylon is sure because though the grandfather had a personal relationship with Yahweh, the children that succeeded never saw the value in having a relationship to themselves. I heard an old saying one time, and I believe it's true. God has no grandchildren. You can't get in on the faith of your parents. He only has children. Begotten of the Spirit. And his direct line. We were made heirs and joint heirs with Jesus. We're God's kids. The name of the grandson is Belshazzar. Sometimes when people read Daniel, they get confused because Daniel's name was Belteshazzar. And this is talking about an entirely different person. It's talking about the king. Belteshazzar, Belteshazzar, Belshazzar, now I confused him. The king made a great feast for a thousand of his lords and drank wine in the presence of the thousand. And while he tasted the wine, Belshazzar gave the command to bring the gold and silver vessels which his father Nebuchadnezzar had taken from the temple. Let me give you an idea of what's happening here. This is at the end of the period predicted by Daniel for the golden head of the 90-foot statue. As this is being portrayed, a massive army of Medes and Persians are outside of the city gates of Babylon. A common tactic in those days was to sit as long as it took for the city to run out of water and run out of food. And when you finally got to that point, the inhabitants would either die or try to make a run for it, and that's when you attack. But Babylon posed some real problems. Babylon was surrounded by two successive walls all the way around. The dimensions of the city were 15 miles by 15 miles. It was a square. There were over 100 sentry posts all the way around. The walls were 100 feet thick and they were 300 feet high. It was said that of the city of Babylon that it was possible 
to have races around the top that were four chariots wide. They felt absolutely, completely, and totally secure. Well, what about a siege? It was said that Babylon at all times had enough food stored within the walls for 20 years. In addition to that, it was constructed in such a way that the river Euphrates flowed through the city. You couldn't cut them off from water. They had food. These were preppers. <laughs> they had food. They had water. They had security. And they had a robust army that was ready for anything and no way for an enemy force to scale those walls. They were seemingly impregnable. The king, as a gesture to the people to show them just how unconcerned he was about this force outside the walls, throws a party for the intelligentsia. In excavations of the area where Babylon was, they found numerous banquet halls. One banquet hall was large enough to hold 10,000 people. It was a party city. In this particular banquet hall, 1,000 people are there to celebrate the fact that the Medes and the Persians would die of old age before they would ever get into the city. They felt absolutely secure. It's like some people. Some people feel that they are secure and immune from any difficulty because of things they possess. Some people have the idea that the relationships they have with people in high places puts them in a position where they are in no danger of some unfortunate thing befalling them. The king was in just this kind of a position. Second verse. And while he tasted the wine, Belshazzar gave a command to bring the gold and silver vessels which his father Nebuchadnezzar, and when it says father, it can mean father or grandfather, had taken from the temple which had been in Jerusalem, that the king and his lords, his wives, and his concubines might drink from them. He threw a party for his friends to thumb his nose at the army that was outside. Now he makes his biggest, most grievous mistake. Now, after thumbing his nose at the opposing army, he orders that the things that have been looted from the Temple of Solomon, you'll remember from our study that when God ordered the furnishings of the, the tent, the tabernacle, and then as they copied those to build Solomon's temple, each of the elements that the temple was made of, each of the elements that, that, that the, the, the housing, the tent for the Ark of the Covenant was made of, were types and shadows of things in heaven. Belshazzar presumptuously commands them to bring the things that were dedicated for a holy purpose, the types of heaven, and thumbs his nose at God to use it as common table. Now I'll tell you, I don't know if you've ever been in this position, but you try standing up and shaking your fist in the face of God. You won't like it. I know, I've tried it. It was arrogant, it was the wrong thing to do, and I regret it with all my heart. So now we have a man and we know something about his character. He is ignorant of who he's dealing with concerning these table implements. He is ignorant in that he thinks he is absolutely secure and God cannot and will not do anything to him in that circumstance. Normalcy bias. That's one of the things that a Christian cannot afford to have. 
We cannot afford to think things will continue the way they are today. The Bible tells us God has revealed to us exactly what's going to happen as the end time approaches. Things are going to change. There is going to be a one world government. There absolutely are going to be plagues and famines. There is going to be a massive die off of human beings. All of those things are sure and certain. It's reality. There are other realities as well. God is faithful to his children. We are going home to an existence that we cannot possibly imagine for its glory. That God loves the world so much that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes on him should not perish but have everlasting life. Trouble starts in a Christian home and in a Christian life when we start to accept the normalcy bias of this world and when we do not have a firm focus on the reality of what God says and the certainty that it will happen. Third verse, then they brought the gold vessels that had been taken from the temple of the house of God, which had been in Jerusalem. And the king and his lords, his wives and his concubines drank from them. They drank wine and praised the gods of gold and silver and bronze and iron, wood and stone. If I could give you the, the Samuel paraphrase, they took the things that were intended to be holy and shook them in God's face as they worshipped false gods. We in this country have seen this over and over. People who forsake what God has to say about our relationships one to another and in self-worship make the decision that we have the right to judge God and determine whether we accept what he says or whether we don't. Fifth verse, in that same hour, the fingers of a man's hand appeared and wrote opposite the lampstand on the plaster of the wall of the king's palace. And the king saw the part of the hand that wrote. Do you think they were, there were a thousand shook up people in that banquet hall? A hand, just a hand, appears and write something on the wall. You know the old saying? You know, boy, I could read the handwriting on the wall for that one. That's where this, that saying comes from, is this portion of scripture. They've gotten drunk. They've thumbed their nose at God. They discounted the possibility that all their personal work will not save them in the building of these massive walls massive defenses and their massive wealth. And now something happens that shakes everyone to the core. Then the king's countenance changed. Yeah, but I'll bet. And his thoughts troubled him, you think? So that the joints of his hips were loosened and his knees knocked against each other. This boy shook. <clears throat> the king cried aloud to bring the, in the astrologers, the Chaldeans, and the soothsayers. The king spoke, saying to the wise men of Babylon, whoever reads this writing and tells me its interpretation shall be clothed with purple and have a gold chain around his neck. Purple was very difficult to come by. It had to be a dyed color. And if you'll remember, the reward for Daniel for his service was to be clothed in purple and to have the gold chain around his neck. 
something occurred after the death of Nebuchadnezzar that got Daniel demoted. Now, I want to say something to people. You know God has spoken to you at some point in your life and told you that he has a purpose for you. And it may have been some time ago. Daniel knew the secret of leaning in to his calling. You say, what do you mean by that? There is a circumstance that God frequently uses with people in the scripture. We see it with Moses. We see it with Joshua. You say, what are you talking about? God will do something miraculously with that person as a younger person. And then there will be a space of time where sometimes people even begin to doubt they were ever called to begin with. And then all of a sudden, God uses them again. Why God chooses to do it that way, I'm not sure. But I do know that in Moses' case, God put him in Pharaoh's courts. He had a complete change of heart. He started to stand up for God with his Hebrew brothers. And then everything dropped out. The bottom of his life just faded. He wound up on the backside of the desert. And he was 80 years old before God started using him again. Joshua, as a young man, followed the armies of the Most High God, was one of those that went with his compatriot, uh, Caleb, and they went in to spy out the land. And when they came back, they found they were the only two that were excited, brought back fruits from the land. And they said, we are well able to take this land. Why others said, no, there's giants. We dare not do that. And after 40 years of wandering in the desert, 40 years seemingly, seemingly forsaken by God, 40 years where nothing seemed to be happening in his life. The day came, God moved powerfully, and young Joshua, one of the only two that believed God, was made the leader of the entire Hebrew nation and led Israel into the promised land. Same thing happened with Daniel. Used him as a young man after the death of Nebuchadnezzar. 23 years, it seems that he has been in obscurity and somehow the position that was granted to him by Nebuchadnezzar was lost. If you're here this morning and God ever spoke to you about something he is going to do, about a call on your life, as a younger person, I'm here to tell you, don't give up on God and don't give up on yourself because it's a well-worn pattern with God to bring you to a place where he activates that call. Then King Belshazzar was greatly troubled. His countenance was changed and his lords were astonished. The queen, because of the words of the king and his lords, came to the banquet hall. The queen spoke saying, O king, live forever. Do not let your thoughts trouble you, nor let your countenance change. Now, <clears throat> Many Bible scholars believe that what's actually happening here is this was one of the wives, one of the older women of Nebuchadnezzar. And she was there during the days 
when Daniel was doing what appeared to be the miraculous. And because they had not wanted to remember the name of Daniel's God, he left, God left her alive and in a position where she could speak of the deeds that Daniel had done. There is a man in your kingdom in whom is the spirit of the holy God. And in the days of your father, light and understanding and wisdom, like the wisdom of the gods, were found in him. And King Nebuchadnezzar, your father, your father the king, that can also be translated grandfather, made him chief of the magicians, astrologers, Chaldeans, and soothsayers. Inasmuch as an excellent spirit, knowledge, understanding, interpreting dreams, solving riddles, and explaining enigmas were found in this Daniel, whom the king named Belteshazzar. Now let Daniel be called and he will give the interpretation. Then Daniel was brought in before the king. The king spoke and said to Daniel, are you that Daniel who is one of the captives from Judah, whom my father, the king, brought from Judah? I have heard of you that, you, that the spirit of God is in you and that light and understanding and excellent wisdom are found in you. Now the wise men, the astrologers, have been brought in before me that they should read this writing and make known to me its interpretation. But they could not give the interpretation of the thing. And I have heard of you that you can give interpretations. And turn pages. And explain enigmas. Now, if you can read the writing and make known to me its interpretation, you shall be clothed in purple and have a gold chain around your neck and shall be the third ruler in the kingdom. Listen to the way Daniel answers him. Daniel's looked at the wall. He's heard from God. And he answers like somebody that knows what's about to happen. Daniel answered and said before the king, let your gifts be to yourself and give your rewards to another. In other words, I know in about five hours you're going to be dead. And I know that the kingdom's going to be overturned. I know that the dream I had that God gave me, showing me that your grandfather's kingdom was going to end with him and that you've lost everything. You keep whatever you've got. It doesn't mean anything to me. Let your gifts be for yourself and give your rewards to another. Yet I will read the writing to the king and make known to him the interpretation. O king, the most high God, O king, the most high God gave Nebuchadnezzar your father a kingdom and majesty and glory and honor. And because of the majesty he gave him, all the people's nations and languages trembled and feared before him. Whomever he wished, he executed. Whomever he wished, he kept alive. Whomever he wished, he set up. And whomever he wished, he put down. But when his heart was lifted up, and his spirit was hardened in pride. He was deposed from his kingly throne and they took his glory from him. Now, get the picture here. Daniel may, apparently has never met this young man. He's been excluded from the court. He's not been before the king. And Daniel talks to him like he's a junior high school kid. 